and thank you all for being here. I was going to give you a quick update on DC, and then I'd love to take your questions. Good. Uh, I want to first thank Ron Lee and the others that helped organize this. I have a couple of my staff members here. Uh, Caleb Hinkle is based in Missoula. He's covering Flathead. Also, uh, Brett is here from Helena. Uh, he helps me out. We have a great team. Um, I just hired a new chief of staff, uh, Christine Hegum. Uh, Christine grew up in Winifred, Montana. She worked for Conrad. She lobbied, she was on Senate Appropriations. She lobbied for the rural electric co-ops and then was on House Agriculture. Um, her Twitter handle is Montana Gal in DC. So she's been on the Hill 18 years. She knows everybody. In fact, a couple of weeks ago we had my team together and we kind of went around the table and everybody introduced themselves. And what was really cool is how many small, rural Montana towns were represented. Christine's from Winifred. I have a guy from grew up in Plentywood. Another gentleman grew up in Ritchie, Malta, Zorgman, Phillipsburg, Dillon. Um, so it's kind of cool. And the rest of them come from those big metropolises. <laughs> no, we have so Townsville and Missoula and Bozeman and places like that. Uh, Susan's with me. She's always with me. We're, there she is. So, so we'll be. I could not do what I'm doing without her. She commutes to D.C. with me every week. Uh, we made the commitment to be back here in Montana each weekend. We're rarely home, uh, but we do get a chance to travel around the state. I got sworn in June 21st, and by the end of August, I had been back and done an event in each one of all 56 counties. Wow. All right, so all over the state. And that, I, I really love that part. It's really fun to, to be out and, and visit with folks. Uh, and I, I want to thank you all. I, I just, it is an honor to serve you back in D.C. Uh, it's, uh, we have, this, America is special. Yeah. And uh, it's this, but the liberties we have are uh, not only precious, but they're also fragile. And if we don't defend them, we're going to lose them. And this country's been through a lot. You look back, I mean, two world wars, a depression, um, and now we just happen to be attacked by uh, progressive ideology and a press that's not our friend. And we need to be vigilant because the American dream is still alive. You know, it, in America, we believe that if you work hard, follow the rules, and persevere, you can raise a family, you can put a roof over your head, you can prosper and the next generation could be better off than the last. But not if we overtax it and overregulate it. Right. And that's why we always have to be vigilant. So I have some good news. We passed tax reform. <laughs> and uh, I don't think we all appreciate just yet what a boost in the arm this is going to be for our economy. I'm starting to hear stories. I was talking to a gentleman up in Harlem, Montana, near Fort Belknap, uh, and he has a small insurance agency. And he went and met with his tax accountant, came back, and he, the news was so good, he gave every one of his six employees a raise, and then he hired a seventh. That's great. Because of the tax policy. Yeah. I was meeting with a, uh, I was, we were talking to a manufacturer down in Stevensville, uh, and they gave every one of their employees a raise. Uh, I'll be meeting later today with Ray's old company, Applied Materials here, formerly Semi-Tool, and uh, they're continuing to expand. I, I can't say this is directly attributable to the tax policy, but they're, they're adding 18 additional positions over there. Um, and this is what this is all about. We've got to get our economy going. Um, I, those who, uh, some of you in the room may be retired. Some are still working. But I'm encouraging people, the new withholding tables are now out. The IRS has issued them. Employers are implementing them. They've asked them to get them done by the end of February. So at the end of the February, I'm asking people to check their check because mm -hmm. they're getting a raise. Yeah. Um, tax rates at every income level have gone down. There's been some criticism of the tax code, though, from those who oppose it. And we even have some that oppose it here in Montana. I quite, can't quite understand that, how letting people keep more of their own money is, is a bad thing. Um, the, they said, well, it's going to blow up the deficit. Right? This is the argument. Well, let me give you a little, uh, some of the facts. Um, 
our economy has been anemic for 10 years. It's been growing at 1.8%. And we can do better than that. Historically, it's grown north of 3%. Well, if our economy grows just half a percent faster, if it goes from 1.8 to 2.3%, that pays for this entire tax code. The whole thing's paid for. Half a percent faster. Now, if we grow a percent faster, or maybe 2% faster, which I think is possible, all of a sudden we have trillions of dollars in federal tax revenue to pay down the debt, to lower taxes again, to build the wall, to do a whole bunch of things. You know, so this is good news. Now, I just, we were sort of under, it sort of felt, this last weekend sort of felt like the U.S. House of Representatives was uh, under house arrest back in D.C. <laughs> while we sorted out this shutdown thing. Uh, and we, we voted uh, two nights ago to, to put the wheels back on the government, get it opened back up. Uh, and I'm thankful for that because now our troops are getting paid again. Right. And 24,000 kids in the state of Montana have health insurance again. But it was a minority. It, it was just the Democrats in the Senate who made a decision to prioritize illegal immigration ahead of low-income kids and our troops. And, uh, boy, that's really disappointing, those kind of misguided priorities. Um, I am pleased that this continuing resolution, one of the arguments that was put forward was, well, all you're doing is continuing resolutions. You're not funding the government long term. Well, again, we'll go back to facts for a second. Um, last September, the U.S. House passed a full set of appropriations bills that fully funded the government. All 12 appropriations bills were last September. The thing that hasn't happened is the Senate hasn't voted on them. Um, and somebody asked me, so what do you, what's the biggest surprise since you've been in D.C.? I'd have say how much stuff is getting done in the House and how little is getting done in the Senate. Very little. Let me give you some numbers. In the House, We've passed almost 500 bills in the last 12 months. Immigration reform, medical malpractice reform. We funded the wall. We provided more accountability on many of our uh, entitlement programs that would bring things there. We, we increased uh, uh, military spending. We increased funding for the VA. Um, and all of that in those appropriations bills would balance with some of the cost cutting we did in other areas would actually balance the federal budget in 10 years. That's what we passed in September. So the Senate just chose not to act on any of this stuff. The other thing we've been working on, it's been a real priority for me, I'm very pleased to serve on the <coughs> Natural Resources Committee, which is the one that has oversight for federal lands, our forests, mining permits, Indian affairs. Um, and as we know, and you've suffered it here, is we haven't been managing our forests very well. Mm -hmm. So I co-sponsored a bill called the Resilient Federal Forest Act. And this, does, this streamlines permitting. It reduces the impact of these frivolous litigations that have been tying us up in knots that prevent us. And, and let's be really clear. When we manage our forests, we have healthier forests. There's more wildlife. There's more hunting opportunities. We have jobs in our mills, and we have less fires. Fuel only comes out of a forest in one of two ways. Either we harvest it, or we burn it. And we've stopped harvesting, so now we're burning. And that's a huge health and safety issue, uh, and we need to do better. So um, that bill, uh, I we introduced it with Bruce Westerman. Bruce Westerman's a representative out of Arkansas. He's a forester by profession, um, and it passed, I'm pleased to say it passed out of committee, uh, and it passed out of the House. This forest reform bill that streamlines permitting, helps accelerate salvage timber operations, and fixes fire borrowing, it also repeals the Cottonwood decision, uh, which is one of this thing over the links that's been tying us in knots. It passed out of the House. That's another bill that's sitting in the Senate waiting for action. So if you want to do something walking out of here, I would encourage you to call your senator and tell them to vote for this Resilient Federal Forest Act. Uh, it's a good comprehensive bill, and it would get us back at our, put people to work and give us healthier forests. Um, 
I will say one other thing that's been a bright spot for me is at how responsive the cabinet secretaries have been to requests that I've sent for dealing with excessive regulation. I had a, a guy in Butte, um, Mark Matheny, who makes the UDAP bear spray. Well, the EPA under Obama told him the propellant he was using in these little cans was damaging the ozone layer. Oh boy. And uh, they wanted him to use a different propellant. The problem is the one they were suggesting doesn't propel. <laughs> so who wants a can of bear spray where it doesn't really come out that well? I don't. Anyway, they were giving them the runaround. We went to bat, and I found this, that when we can present a common sense argument to one of these Trump appointees, uh, they get to the bottom of it, they get it resolved. We got him a reprieve, he can continue to manufacture bear spray that's going to propel. Another silly one, and this is, these may sound like little things, but he wouldn't have a business anymore. I was talking to the county commissioners up in Shelby, and you know I-15 goes through Shelby up to the Canadian border. There's a bunch of BLM land up there, and there's a bunch of alkali flats. And if you spend any time up there at all, you know the wind blows. And they had these problems with whiteout on I-15, where the alkali flats get whipped up and there's these clouds. Well, they had a death on the highway because somebody got disoriented and they ran off the road and they were killed. And uh, so the county commissioners called the BLM and said, we'd like to put some large square bales there out in the alkali flats to create a windbreak so we don't get these whiteout conditions. It seemed to make sense, you know, low cost solution. Well, the BLM said that you could do that, but they've got to be certify weed free. Yeah. <laughs> well, they didn't have a source of certified weed free large square bales. Now, if you know anything about like alkali flats, you know nothing grows there. Right. <laughs> so like what's gonna germinate from these <laughs> anyway, this was this was a common sense, you know, argument. So I called the head of BLM, he's in Billings. He's over all of Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And I said, uh, his name is Bill Raby, and uh, he's, a, he's a good guy. I'd met him on some of the fires I'd been on. And I said, there's nothing going to germinate. He says, you know, you, you're actually making sense. You know? So we got a waiver, wow. and now they put the square bales up there. These are little things, but hopefully we save somebody's life. Yeah. You know? Good job. Um, so we'll continue to work this stuff. I would just, if you're experiencing something a federal agency is doing that doesn't make sense, is silly or idiotic, um, please reach out to our office. We've gone to bat now on about 20 of these issues across the state, and the likelihood that a freshman congressman is going to go to Washington and introduce the bill that is going to be the exact replacement for Obamacare, and everybody in the House and the Senate is going to go, why didn't I think of that? That's pretty low. Right. <laughs> But can I take care of the little things that are getting in the way of our precious way of life here because the federal government's not doing their job? I can do that. And I can do that. It's an easy thing to do. So please reach out. Again, we, we hear from a lot of folks. If you have people that have inquiries, our website's gnforte.house.gov. We get about 8,000 inquiries a week. We try and respond to everyone personally, um, at least with a position paper on the issue that someone's raised so they at least know where we stand. And we, we listen to those. Um, I'll always take my principles in making these decisions, uh, but local input's incredibly important. And that's why I'm thrilled to be here with you today. I just want to conclude by saying, and then we'll take questions, is uh, you know, it, it really is an honor to serve you. And I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's, the, you know, you, I learned in business a long time ago that you, you just can't worry about things you can't control. Uh, but I'm convinced that a business guy back there using common sense uh, can actually have influence. And uh, we are, and, uh, and we will. And uh, I just appreciate you being here today. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Who, who wants to ask the first question? Yes, sir. I'm fascinated by your forestry yeah. initiative, I believe yeah. you said. Um, is there any estimation on how long, uh, let's say it passed, um, before everything would be 
back to under control, let's say. Yeah. It, well, so to speak. it took a long time to dig this hole. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a long time to get out. Um, Is it a 10 year plan, 20 year plan, 50 year plan, what? You know, uh, it, it's at least a decade. I mean, we got to get some larger projects. I mean, to give you an example of what's going on right now, down in Lincoln, uh, there were about six sections of land, so six square miles of land that they were going to manage. And everybody agreed, the county commissioners, the local property owners, the Forest Service, they worked together. It still took them eight years to get the permit. Gee. Not to clear cut anything. This is just to thin the forest. They got the permit. It took eight years. And then as soon as they awarded the contract to RY Timber to come in and do the work, they got sued in court. And the judge said there's no imminent danger of fire here, so we're going to shut. And, and I'm not sure you took care of the links. So um, it, it, an injunction was issued. Took care of the what? The links. <laughs> Canadian links. Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It's just like the spotted owl. Spotted owl. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that forest burned this past summer. Oh, oh well. <laughs> so there's no lynx habitat there now. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. So we've just got to bring some common sense. Most of that Resilient Federal Forest Act is tort reform to limit the impact of these frivolous lawsuits. Because right now the, the environmental extremists are using the current law to profit from us as the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we have to change. We're doing the same thing with the Endangered Species Act. We've put a number of common sense guardrails on the Endangered Species Act. Now, that those bills have passed out of committee. We haven't voted on them on the House floor yet, the, the ESA reforms. Great. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Sir. Um, HB 490, I think, is the number. Um, it's the uh, heartbeat bill. Yes. Do you know where that sits? Yep. Uh, it's Steve King's bill. I'm a co sponsor yes, on it. Yes, I know. Um, we just had a vote out of the House last week on this, uh, uh, let me remember the two specifically. The one we passed last week was the Born Alive Abortion right. Survivors right. Bill. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that passed out of the House. We're waiting for the Senate to act. Right. Right. That basically says if a, if, if a baby is born alive as a result of an abortion, uh, the, all the attending uh, folks have a legal obligation to get that baby all the medical care that any other child would receive. Mm -hmm. And there are criminal penalties if you don't. Right. You're here. So that, awesome. passed, that passed out of the House last week. Uh, last fall, we voted for uh, the pain-capable bill, and we passed that out of the House, which basically says uh, if a baby can, uh, in the womb can uh, experience pain, well then, um, uh, you know, there's restrictions at that point. So uh, that mm -hmm. passed out of the House. Right. So this is, I, I know I've heard Speaker Ryan speak on a number of occasions. Um, last spring, uh, prior to me arriving, um, the House voted to defund Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. So it is a very strong pro-life House. But again, we need the Senate to do their job. So HB 490 hasn't been voted on yet? It has not come to the floor. There's 170... Yeah, and, and to, for a bill to pass the House, um, you know, we need 218. Uh, there's good, strong pro-life support in the House. Um, Steve King's been an advocate for that bill, um, and I, I think I co I'm co-sponsor on the bill. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything the voters can do to motivate the leaders of the Senate who would bring those bills into the Senate to be voted yeah. on? Um, call. They can contact our... Senators personally, but there must be some. Yeah, there's two things. Understand what it, it's happening for um, two reasons. One is um, there is not a large Republican majority in the Senate. That's one issue. We're only 51. Um, and in addition, the Senate has a bunch of arcane rules related to the filibuster where they can't, to get, to end debate on any issue, you need 60 votes. The, the perverse issue, though, is that this 60-vote rule was put in place, sounds odd, to actually speed up things in the Senate. <laughs> but now it's being used to slow things down. This is not something our founding fathers put in place. It does not exist in the original Constitution. It was added later by man. It's sort of like Old Testament days. We're adding the laws. But um, 
what happened was senators speak a lot. So they wanted a rule that if 60 senators decide that they should shut out and we sit out and we should vote on it, 60 can agree and then it's over and we vote. Well, now it's being used to prolong things. So it's the exact opposite of what we intended. <coughs> if you're going to call senators, I would encourage them to end the filibuster and then do what you can to get more conservatives elected. Oh, yes. I had the brief opportunity to look over Secretary Zinke's plan, and I guess my first reaction was, oh, he's trying to keep the size of government down to a dull roar. It kind of made sense to me because he was looking at reducing the number of personnel that we're, we're paying for. He's looking to centralize his department. And so, of course, on Facebook, all the negative people get on and start bashing it right away. <laughs> And there may be they must be doing something right. It. But I looked at it and I said, okay, he's he's being a leader. Yeah. So what other departments are looking at? It's happening in every department. Is it? I yeah. I, uh, uh, Ryan's number one guy, his chief operating officer at the Department of Interior is Dave Bernhardt. And I'll share a little story. I had lunch with him in December. There were about five other members of the House there. And I asked him, I said, you know, uh, do you think... Uh, better decisions are made if they're made closer to the people or farther away? Okay, I was baiting him a little bit. He said, well, closer. I said, good. I said, where is most of the BLM land in the U.S.? Well, he said, it's out west. I said, well, that's right. We have a lot in Montana. You know, there's a lot around Malta, Montana. What's the opportunity to move the headquarters of BLM to Malta, Montana? Would you do that? Because you think about that. We have all this concentration of power back in Washington inside the Beltway. These people don't know a cattle guard from a fence post, right? And so, but his answer was kind of interesting. He said, don't expect a big announcement anytime soon. We're not going to announce that we're moving the headquarters out west. Uh, we're not going to see us announce that we're laying off a whole bunch of BLM workers. But anybody that's run a larger organization, Ray certainly has, you know you have a certain amount of attrition every year. I know in our business, we had about 20% attrition every year. Well, 20% attrition, over a five-year period, you turn the whole organization over. So what he told me was, don't expect any big announcements, but know that an awful lot of our hiring requisitions are being opened in the Rocky Mountain West. Hmm. So that'll just kind of go on smoothly without any big announcement, and we'll wake up someday and find out that maybe the headquarters is out west someplace. I think that's going on in every agency. Um, just, just to support what you just said, my husband used to work for BLM, mm -hmm. and he said that years ago, that yeah. there should be a center out west. Yeah, because there's no BLM land on the East Coast, or very little. So, yes? Any word on Karen Bud Fallon being named to the BLM, heading it up? Do you I, know don't, her? I just don't. I Wyoming attorney. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nothing going around Washington. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, I have a question uh, about on the reservation. Uh, the tribe is uh, okay. implementing the compact. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it's going to affect right away is, is the water that's stored in the reservoirs for irrigation. The compact cuts the amount of water to irrigators by 50% which will put them out of business. So between now and summer, <coughs> they're really afraid they're not going to have enough water for the crops. And I know you're on the Natural Resources Committee, and uh, we haven't been able to get that information to Zinke yet. Is there anything that, that you could do in that area to help these irrigators out? Yeah, so it's a, I mean, the compact is still in process. It's not law yet. Right. That's so, correct. yeah. So, um, you know, I know you sent us a letter. I don't know what happened to it, but this is the sort of stuff that we'd like to follow up with. So, I'll have somebody contact you. We'll we'll get the details. Sounds good. Thank you. About DACA. Uh huh. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Do we get all of those people in one lump sum, or can we scrutinize them and pick out the ones that are going to be an advantage to us? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, that was the whole deal in this government shutdown, was uh, uh, the Senate Democrats said these 
people who have come here illegally are more important than the American people. But we are going to have, this is something we're going to have to deal with. Uh, President Trump uh, reversed the DACA rule, which we believe was unconstitutional, that uh, Barack Obama put in place, mm -hmm. and said, hey, Congress, you go figure it out. And he gave us six months to do it. Mm -hmm. So we've got till March to come up with, to do something or do nothing. Those are the two options, right? That's, those are always yeah. the two options. Mm -hmm. Uh, the consensus, there is a very, there's a, a bill, I, I read the 60-page summary of the bill um, just this past week that's authored by Bob Goodlatte, Raul Labrador out of uh, Idaho, and Martha McSally. And it is compre a comprehensive immigration bill. I know the sentiment in the House is we're not going to do anything about the dreamers if we don't do comprehensive immigration reform. I personally don't believe that um, I, I do someone who came here at two years old and they're here abiding by the laws, working a job, paying taxes. We ought to provide some kind of a accommodation to permanent resident status or even some kind of renewable resident status, not citizenship. Now, there's probably a process for them to get to citizenship, just like there is for anybody else that wants to immigrate and become a citizen. But follow the rules. But to do that and not secure the border will put us right back in the situation five years from now. So, so the four components in that meeting that Donald Trump had with House and Senate leadership just over a week ago, there were four components. And I think this is the sentiment of the House. Um, deal with dreamers. Um, uh, end the chain migration, which allows people to break things in. Get rid of the diversity lottery. lottery yeah. So we're more of, to your point, more of a merit-based system, and you got to secure the border. Mm -hmm. So if we get those four things, I think that there is consensus in the House that we vote for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no so, no, yeah. No, don't. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you uh, yeah. for all your efforts and the things that you are doing and trying to do. On the vein of, we're in Upper Columbia uh, River Basin, and we have an AIS issue now, a product of invasive species, and I know you know about it. I've sent you some letters and our other uh, other uh, delegation. We need some funding. So we haven't, we're not the one that caused the problem, but other states have. Mm -hmm. so in my letter to you and our, and to our governor and the other senators, we've asked, hey, when you're talking and when you're discussing things, can you say, hey, can you help us out here with some funding? Because our state doesn't have a lot of funding, as we all know. And I just wonder what have you heard or any input or any ideas. I have. We're going to have. We ought to have follow-up dialogue on that. Brett, if you just take a note, we'll follow up the. Um, we need to. The easiest way to do it is find a federal program that already exists, where this project would qualify under it, because that doesn't require legislative action. If we're going to appropriate money. We have to find an offset someplace. So you got to take it from somewhere. Now, we can do that. It's a lot harder. My First Amendment, in fact, um, that passed out of the House, I actually got, it, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was money to help with uh, forest management projects. And I had to take it from somewhere. So I took it from salaries at the EPA. <laughs> in my mind, that was a double win. <laughs> so um, appropriations are harder. Um, and even though that appropriation went in, again, we passed it out of the House, and those appropriations bills never got considered in the Senate. So if we want to get something done, and that's what I'm interested in, I'll need your help. We can work together. We've got to find a federal program, probably under U.S. Wildlife Service, which is under Ryan. Um, Greg Sheehan runs that organization. We need to find a program and then just make sure this is on the priority list. And we, we should just work together on that. Make sure, you know, Brett has, yes. Do you know of anything that's being done to stop giving taxpayer money to other countries and then turning around and using the money against us? <laughs> well, we just saw it, and the president did that in Pakistan here recently, right, where he cut off military assistance until they got tougher on terrorists. Th those are mostly, um, we, we've certainly taken some strong stances in on North Korea and Iran. Um, 
uh, but I, I know the administration's on the same page there. Two hundred and fifty million UN. The cut in the UN. Yeah. There's Senate members though that are happy. Yeah. Derek? Thank you again for your service. That's awesome. Thank you, Susan, for the sacrifices you make as a spouse. That's awesome. I'm involved with ETIC in Helena, and there's still a lot of stuff coming down the pike <laughs> that has a lot of this carbon capture language in it, which is driving up the price of everything. Any getting new dams, any new powers, and that's all based on the CO2 requirement that the EPA created. Is there anything that Congress is doing to reverse that? I mean, yeah. I know Trump's against global warming now, but what can we do to make that trickle down to us? Yeah. So I actually had an amendment that passed out a committee uh, on this so social cost of carbon. And I don't know if you know, up in the Bull Mountains, south of Roundup, is the Signal Peak coal mine. And they were expanding, applied for a permit. It got denied by a judge because they had not included the carbon emissions from the locomotives that take the coal to the West Coast. Because oh. oh. you hadn't fully considered the environmental impact of, you can imagine if we went to Boeing and said, oh, you want to build new aircraft? Um, you have to calculate into the social cost of carbon all the jet fuel that thing's going to burn for its whole life. Right? Yeah. Um, but uh, I introduced an amendment in committee uh, that would restrict the calculation of social cost of carbon strictly to the carbon that's emitted on location during the production, either um, you know the actual you know whatever it is, and that, that is at least start trying to rein that stuff in. But there's more we need to do. I want to comment on one other thing, if I could, that's come up quite a bit. Uh, you've heard a lot about these um, FISA violations by yeah. the FBI yes. and other agencies. Um, and you know, there is this top secret memo um, that was uh, investigated and prepared. Uh, that's been made, ama made available to all members of Congress. I've read it uh, back in D.C. Uh, it's not long. It's only about four pages long. Um, we are working on getting that made public. Uh, it's going to take two to three weeks because we have to be sure that our intelligence community that collected this information, their methods and identities are not revealed uh, because we want them to continue to serve this country. Um, but when we do that, it'll get released and it'll bring, shine some light in some dark places. Yeah. Yes. What, if anything, um, is being done to demilitarize these alphabet soup organizations that aren't even necessarily federal or quasi-federal? Um, you know, I, I think the administration is doing that. We need to do more. Um, and the best thing you can do is, as you see in fractions, let our office know. And that's stuff we can go to work on. Because I am also on oversight and government reform, which is the whistleblower. This is Trey Gowdy's committee. We have oversight on all federal agencies. And we can call a hearing on anything we want. Mm -hmm. Yes? So talk to us about the deep state since you're on the Oversight Committee. <laughs> well, um, some of it's handled by uh, House Intelligence. Yeah. Some is handled by OGR. Um, I haven't been in a lot of those hearings yet, except to have seen this memo. Um, but uh, there, are, there, are, there are concerns there. And, you know, with any, yeah. with any situation, you know, any group, there's, there's going to be violations. We just have to make sure people that manipulate the system for... Um, the wrong purposes are that the same rules apply to them that apply to everybody yeah, else. That's right. So we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. Good. Well, I, again, I will have to stay and visit. Anybody have any other questions? Yes. I, on the same subject of this state, you, you mentioned attrition before, but why in our government does the Department of Justice, for example, have a big problem with? We've got people who. We cer certainly see a lot of information about, but yet they get moved to another position. Mm. Is it because of the unions, or is there something else involved? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. But we need to bring more accountability there. I, on the good news, and this is the sentiment of the House, you know, as we've been passing bills, and it's been tough to get the Senate to vote on stuff. So the strategy now is to take pieces of these legislation and kind of cram them into things they have to vote on. Oh. Yeah. So you saw this mm -hmm. in December. When we passed the tax reform bill, there are a few things in there that didn't get that much attention. Um, we, uh, 
not only did the tax bill pass, you saw we increased the child deduction to $2,000. That's good because it's going to help families with that. Right. But we also required that to apply for it, the child has to have a Social Security number. No. The cost, I mean the savings from just doing that one thing, $200 billion wow. over 10 years. Wow. That's how much fraud there is in the system. So crazy. Yep. Um, we also, in December, we opened up 2,000 acres in Anwar. Uh, Don Young represents Alaska. He has the largest geographic congressional district in the country. Do you know how long he'd been working on trying to get Anwar opened up? 38 years. He's been in Congress 45 years. He's kind of a crusty old guy. You'd really like him. He, uh, he became the dean of the house two weeks ago. And Paul Ryan congratulated him. The sole responsibility of the dean of the house, which means they're the, the most senior, most tenured individual. The sole responsibility of the dean is to swear in the new speaker of the house. That's the only thing they do. That's their only responsibility, other than the prestige that comes from being there longer than anybody else. And Paul Ryan got up and on the floor he said, Don, it says here clearly that your job now is to swear in the Speaker of the House at the beginning of each session. It does not say swear at the Speaker of the House. Yeah. <laughs> Which Don is also guilty of. Yeah. Uh, just want to ask you, what can we be doing back here in Flathead for you know, what's going on in back in D.C. up in the LDU, up in the LDU? I mean, it feels like we've got some positive momentum from this last election. Yeah. And the Flathead's a different piece of that. And so yeah. what can we do to help you out? Well, I would say that this election in the fall is going to be a referendum on Trump. The signature piece of legislation that's helping, going to help the bulk of Montanans is the tax reform bill. Right. I would encourage you, as you hear people say, well, I, I, I do actually have a little more money in my paycheck. Have them write a letter to the editor saying, thank you, Donald Trump, thank you, Republicans. You know, not a single Democrat in the House or the Senate voted for that bill. That's right. That's right. Not a single one. It was the right thing to do. If a business buys a piece of equipment because now they can expense 100% of it in year one, yes. and they're going to expand their capacity, invite the local paper to come out and interview them and make sure you say, hey, I was able to do this because of Donald Trump and the Republicans back in Washington. You know, it, I think we got to really, this uh, tax reform plan is a pony that we can ride for a long time. We just got to get up proud in the saddle and yeah. give her a good kick. <laughs> yeah. The earmarks. Republican earmarks. Mm -hmm. Good thing, huh? Uh, they're not allowed. I, I'm hearing that, uh, that they're, uh, they're wanting them and going to have them. Uh, not under current rules. They're not allowed. I'm going to change the rules, though. Well, I'd like to get rid of the filibuster. <coughs> so I don't. I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you came up to Montnor and uh, took the tour down to the. Yep, down in the attic. Down in the attic, down in the 7200 foot. Um, what can we do? to clean house within our our permitting agencies mm -hmm. where we have people that are definitely biased. I mean, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's to the left. How can we get rid of those people and get back to having an unbiased permitting agency that's going to make common sense, scientific mm -hmm. uh, determinations? Well, there's a bunch of legislation that we're working on to that regards. I mean, some... Uh, the envir these environmental extremists have a business model to fleece the taxpayers. It just happens that they use good projects to do it. Um, so, and when, I'll take Endangered Species Act as an example. When that was first put in place, uh, environmental lawyers were rare. So the act allows a premium to be paid for lawyers that work on environmental issues. And it can be up to seven or eight hundred dollars an hour. So one of the bills, one of the five reforms that we voted out of committee on endangered species was to set the, I call it the uh, Environmental Lawyer Delisting Act. <laughs> because we set, 
the reimbursement rate at the standard governmental lawyer reimbursement rate, which is more like $125 an hour. So that, it still preserves people's right to sue and defend their interests, but it takes some of the air out of the, these projects. The other thing is, when they sue under equal access to justice, they might sue on 30 points. And, uh, you know, air quality, water quality, lynx, grizzly bear, sage grouse, spotted salamander, you know, whatever it is. Um, and if they win on one, even on a technicality, they get 100% of their legal fill yep. bills. So one of the reforms we looked at is uh, prorated reimbursement. If you sue on 30 points and you win on one, you get 1 30th of your legal fees paid. So it still preserves people's rights to sue. Another example, under endangered species. Um, one of the, the, the federal government has a rule under endangered species that if you submit a species for listing, the U.S. Wildlife Service has to respond within 90 days with a determination. And that's a good rule because it keeps things moving along, right? Well, what these environmental extremists have done is they overload the system. They'll submit up to 100 species at one time. And that puts the burden on the U.S. Wildlife Service to go do all the technical research on 100 species all, and of course they can't do that. They just don't have the capacity for it. And when they don't meet the 90-day deadline, these environmental groups sue the U.S. Wildlife Service, and of course they win, and then they get all their legal fees repaid. So what we said was that one of the Endangered Species Act reforms is if you want to apply for a single species, sure, it's 90 days. But if you apply for five, it's five times 90 days. If you apply for 100, it's 100 times 90 days. Right? So that protects the interests that are, people yeah. are trying to use the bill for good purposes, but those that are trying to manipulate it, we're just trying to close those loopholes. So those bills passed out of committee, we're waiting for the House to vote on them. Most of this stuff we're going to have to package up with other bills to get the Senate to vote on it, and that's what we're doing. Okay, we'll take one last question. Go ahead. Uh, the forestry bill you were working on. Yeah. Uh, I was watching the meeting the other day on the computer, and they were talking about the timber that burned. Well, the federal government made a total of 2% of that area available for logging. 2%. 2%. Does your bill do anything to in that particular area where we're re we, we do the state land and not the federal land is your, uh, would your bill deal with that so we get more uh, I guess revenue out of uh, restoring the property that burned yeah so it has a whole section on salvage timber operations to speed up the permitting um, and salvage timber not only burnt timber also includes all the beetle kill or disease timber so it, it does have a provision for that I just want to say, if you want to stay updated on what's going on, uh, my official website, gianforte.house.gov, you can go there, put your email address in, and we send out maybe an email every two weeks or something just on what's going on. I would encourage you to sign up there. If you put your name down on the list, Brett can certainly help you. But I want to thank you for coming out, and thanks for caring about our country. And again, I'm just honored to serve you. Reach out whenever we can help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.